There we go. Now I'm the host. Fantastic. Okay, so since we're recording now, I'll use my official voice. Thank you all for coming, all of you, all 12 of you. My name is Michael Free. I'm going to talk to you about Korean film for a while. And hopefully this will be interesting. I find it really interesting and fascinating. I'm going to have to go rather quickly through this, but that is okay, because what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you my slides as one PDF. It is now uploading. So you can go back and look at all of this stuff that I'm going to show you later on. A few things before we start, just so we're all on the same page. I'm an ELT guy. I'm not a film guy officially, and I'm not a Korean history guy officially. I'm an ELT guy who teaches language through film, sometimes when I'm lucky, and this includes Korean film. So what this means is that a lot of what I'm going to tell you is not really my opinion, it's other people's opinion, uh, especially Cho jun Hyung, his introductory chapter in Rediscovering Korean Cinema. A lot of what I tell you is basically me channeling him and, and using the information he provides there. I'm not a film scholar myself. He is, so it's better that I tell you what he said than tell you what I think, because mm, he's a little bit more of an authority than I am. The films I'm going to show you, most of them have been chosen according to their availability. A lot of these films are available courtesy of the Korean Film Archive in Seoul. You can get them with English subtitles, which is awesome, and you can find English information about them. All the films I'm going to talk about are on, they all have Wikipedia entries, which are great points of entry for you. So I'm going to be giving you names and showing you posters and giving you a bit of socio-cultural political overviews in basically 10-year chunks, very, very broad strokes, which means I'm going to miss a lot of stuff. I know that. I'm sure you understand where I'm at. I'm going to go quickly. It's okay. Don't panic because it's going to be fun. So I'm pretty sure that you have all heard of this thing called the Korean wave or Hallyu or Hanryu. Some people pronounce it that way. I, I chuckle at this particular image because of, of course, that wave, that famous wave is the great wave off Kanagawa, which is a, Japanese woodblock print by Hokusai from a long time ago. I'm not sure if the person did that on purpose or not, but hey, that's okay. Korean wave, I'm sure you've heard of it. And the primary way we hear about Korean wave and the primary way the, the world consumes the Korean wave is through K-pop. And nothing against BTS. They're apparently very good or other K-pop bands, they're very good. But there's other stuff in Korean culture that's very, very much worth looking at. And right now, thank you, Netflix, for all you've done for Korea. You have doubtless heard of Squid Game because it seems to be all anybody is talking about. But if you look at the Netflix rankings, especially in Asian countries, you've got Squid Game number one, Hometown Cha 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 is number two, and another newbie, My Name, is number three. They, they're they taking top slots in a lot of different countries. They're super duper hot right now. And that's that's super duper cool. Uh, Rhea in the chat says, BT isn't a band, it's a god. No, it's not. Sorry, it isn't. You're incorrect. If you do have a, a question as I go along, type it into the chat and uh, I'll try to answer it as best I can. There's not very many of us here. So yeah, James Wright, don't let the army hear you say that. Ah, I'm going to get mobbed. Yeah, I'm, I'm not afraid of that. That would actually be kind of fun. So K-dramas, super hot. K-pop, super hot. 
Uh, yes, I just saw that message about the PDF that I sent to Jasmine instead of everybody. One second, please. There, it should come up for you all in a little minute here. It's just uploading. K-dramas, super good. K-pop, well, I'm a bit snobby. I like film. I think it gives us a bit more depth. And you've probably heard of some Korean films. You've probably heard of Parasite, Gi Sang Jung in Korean, uh, Academy Award winner, Wow by Bong Joon-ho, Snowpiercer, global co-production, also by Bong Joon-ho and one of his favorite actors. It's pretty good. Maybe you heard of Park Chan-wook Stoker, maybe not. It's possible. One thing that I should point out about Korean film is that compared to Korean pop, it is a very different experience. And I saw this little meme on, um, on Twitter, so I downloaded it because it, it kind of gets it right. Of course, as with any meme, it doesn't give you 100% coverage, but there's a big difference between Korean pop music and Korean movies. And I think part of it is that Korean pop music, it's that pop part of it. It's pop culture. It's, you know, it's, it's not serious. It's not art. And Korean movies, man, they, they tend to be art. And they also have a, a tendency to get rather dark. A lot of um, people have commented on Squid Game being quite violent and quite dark. It's not as dark as a lot of the stuff that you'll find if you are familiar with Korean cinema. But don't worry, I'm not only going to talk about horror films, I'm going to talk about some other stuff too. You also might have seen a Korean movie and not even known that you that you saw it. Um, there have been quite a few remakes, some were pretty good. Spike Lee remade Park Tanuk's Old Boy. I didn't mind it, but you are messing with a film classic there, and he got himself in some hot water with the fans. Of course he was going to do that. And you may have seen The Uninvited. No, you didn't. You, you didn't see it. I saw it. Trust me. It's, you'll, you'll live if you never see it. It's a remake of uh, Kim Joon's amazing, awesome sauce, Tale of Two Sisters. Are these remakes any good? Are they worth watching? If they open the door for you to come and watch the originals and get involved in Korean culture and engage with it, then they are worth your time. And I'll tell you something you might not know is that Korean film has been winning on the festival circuit for years and years and years. The film industry has known that Korean film is awesome. And you have even way back in 1961, the family drama, The Coachman won an award. Park Chan-wook has been winning awards for years with Old Boy, not only the most recognizable Korean film in history, but also one of the most iconic scenes in cinematic history. You have Che min Shik playing Odesu walking down that corridor with the hammer. Um, Park chan other works like Thirst are amazing stuff. And on over here on Parasite, that's, that's not Bong Joon-ho, that's Mi Gyeong Lee. And I put a picture of her there because she's one of the things that, one of the things, she's not a thing, she's a person of course, but one of the things that Korean film and, and the Korean government have really wanted is to develop Korea's soft power, whatever that might mean. And she's a, a big proponent of this and she got up and, and spoke at the Academy Awards, a very, very important person in the Korean film industry. Now I'm going to start in the 1950s, but just in, you know, so you know, there is actually a bunch of stuff that happened before the 1950s, even as far back as just the turn of the century in 1901, there was uh, 
Edward Edward Burton Holmes showed up with a camera and so people were watching films Korea was producing films in 1924 1926 they made their first big Korean films. Most of these films don't exist anymore, most of the scholarship or the information isn't in English so i've kind of just made the executive decision to start at 1950s about then. So let's see, where were we at in the 1950s in Korea? Well, it was in what has been called an anomic state. So we've got the Korean War has happened. Um, and I can't even imagine, even though I've lived here for 16 years, I can't imagine the state that this country was in, the amount of lives that were lost, the buildings were destroyed, the infrastructure was destroyed the environment was destroyed, the supplies were exhausted. So you've got a, a completely devastated country. And frankly, it's a bit surprising that they were making films at all at this point, but they were. And what's, what's interesting is that there was a big shift. The conventional and traditional values were told they, they collapsed. The, women were making inroads into the public sphere because a lot of the men had died in the war the population in general had lost faith in the common good the level of sexual freedom went up was elevated and the number one thing that everybody was actually after was just survival that's what people were doing so we we hear this described as an anomic state because you have a bunch of diverse ideologies coexisting so you've got some vestiges of traditional values you've got american liberalism that came over you've got democracy kind of you've got individualism you've got nihilism which is understandable given the state that the country was in you've got war induced survivalism you've got anti-communism of course you do and you've got nationalism which you kind of always have in korea so there's a lot going on and you see that the major works in this period, they portray many aspects of this anime. So you've got works like The Widow by Park Nam Oak in 1955, and A Flower in Hell by Shin Sang-ok in 1958, and possibly the most um, popular film from that point was Madam Freedom, which was uh, directed by Han Hyung-mo in 1956. And this is a, a romantic kind of melodrama about uh, the extramar extramarital affairs of a professor and his, and his wife. And it was, uh, yeah, it was quite, quite shocking for the time because you had uh, the main characters, they were on a bed together and they were, and they were kissing and lying in bed together. And this was really, this was shocking. This was unheard of uh, in at that time in Korea. But so they're, they're quite interesting. You'll also notice that most of the titles here are in Chinese characters. Um, you only, you see on the leftmost poster, The Widow, you have Korean. I asked my wife about this because she's Korean, as some of you know, and she said, yeah, it's because at that point, most of the population were fluent and, and could read Hanja, the Korean, uh, not Korean, the Chinese characters. So that wouldn't be anything odd to them. In the 1960s, we've got what is described as the film Renaissance, a rebirth in Korea. We've got a few different things going on. We've got two big political upheavals. We've got the April Revolution of 1960 and then a military coup in 61. And this, this revolution, it brought some changes to the film industry, which is to say that it, it lifted censorship, even if it was just for a short time. They, had, they created something called the Motion Picture Code of Ethics Committee. And later on in the 60s, South Korea turned the films into what they called a strategic industry. And so they 
they brought in a mass production system. And you can see in, in 1961, they took 65 film production companies and they, they squunched them all together and they consolidated them into 16 entities. And the number of films that came out during that time went up. They sharply increased. The main genres of film that you had at this point were family dramas like The Coachman, basically middle class families. And what they liked to do is kind of pit the older generation, the more traditional values against the younger generation. You had historical dramas like Lady Zhang. And these have been enormously popular both on the big and small screen in Korea since they since they first started coming out. Koreans love their period dramas and they're awesome and we'll we'll talk about them a little bit later on. You also had some films for the kids so you've got the barefooted young or the barefooted youth and then you've also got films that are based on literary works such as The Mist. Ange. Sometimes this is translated as the village of haze, which is a little bit, a little bit neater, but the mist fits on a slide pretty well. The, the early 1960s, though, when there was that temporary lift of censorship is where you got a couple of the most famous Korean films of all time. You had Aimless Bullet and The Housemaid, and these two films when they did a poll, the Korean uh, Film Association did a poll in 2013, these two were tied for first place as th the most important, the best Korean films of all time. And you also had a nice, very interesting film called The House Guest and My Mother by Shin San Ok in 61. But really, it's The Housemaid that is the most important film from this period and it's one of the most important films in, in the Korean canon, if I can still use that word, canon. It's really important. How do I know this? Well, we can actually find a trailer to it in English on, on YouTube. And you can find this movie in its entirety on YouTube as well. Let's just, let's just watch the trailer. You can just see from the comments and the people who are commenting, Martin Scorsese, Bong Joon-ho, Park Chan-wook, um, that this film is very, very well regarded in, in the industry. And let's listen to, let's listen to Martin talk. Hello, I'm eager, very eager for audiences around the world to experience Kim Ki Young's Hanyo or The Housemaid. And I'm really excited and proud that the World Cinema Foundation, which was launched in Cannes one year ago, has helped to facilitate the restoration and preservation of this remarkable picture, which I can safely say is quite unlike anything I've ever seen. Personally speaking, I was startled the first time I saw the picture by its mood of upset, 
its bold expressionism, its sense of the potential danger in all human interaction, and its intense and passionately realized sense of claustrophobia. I don't think it's an easy film, but it is a rich and rewarding one. And it's easy to understand the profound effect Hanyo has had on so many filmmakers in Korea, including Park Chan-wook, Im Sang-soo, and Bong Joon-ho. And when in the last 10 years, Kim Ki-young's pictures have become much better known and more available in the West. And I hope that the trend continues. And now, it's my great pleasure to present Hanyo, or The Housemaid. We, we can't watch it, but you can watch it later. If you go onto YouTube and you search Korean film classics, that's the channel of the Korean film archive. It has this film and pretty much all the, the earlier films that I'm going to talk about are available there with English subtitles completely free. So we're not, you know, you're, we're not doing anything weird with copyright or anything like that. And they'll also have links so that you can go directly to the Kofa website and you can have, uh, you can find more information about all the different titles. That's really, that's really the big film from the sixties. And it's, it's the, one of the big films of, of, of Korean film in its entirety. So let's press on and, and go into the 70s. The 70s is the dark ages. And why is it the dark ages? Well, we've got Park Chung hee is reelected in 67 and he changes the constitution. He puts out a new constitution called Yushin and Korea's back into a dictatorship. Uh, and as we're probably in agreement, dictatorships aren't really the best idea. The film industry deteriorates both in terms of the number of films and the audience attendance, the word that is used a lot is plummeted. It just, it just went way, way, way down. And this was a long recession. It went on until the late eighties. And in addition to the strict censorship that was, <clears throat> excuse me, that was placed on things by within Korea, you also had this thing called TV. Uh, that came onto the scene, and that had a profound effect on on films, not just in Korea, but everywhere, because now people were watching TV, they weren't going out to watch movies anymore. Nevertheless, we still had some films, and and they're, they're pretty good, some of them. Um, you had films like Winter Woman, Kim Ho Son from 1977, It Rained Yesterday by Yi Tang Ho, in 1975 and this quaint film on the left called the march of fools fools is pabo as all korean men know that word because that's kind of what we are and you know when you think of this this film it was adapted from a novel and it was a big hit at the box offices notwithstanding the fact that it was the dark ages the plot is, well, I mean, I'll just tell you what the plot is. It's about a couple of university students and they're men and they make friends with a couple of other university students who are women and they hang out and they drink and they talk about the dreams, their dreams for the future, but the future doesn't really look so great. It's not, as you can probably tell from the poster, not the most serious of films, but people quite liked it. They quite enjoyed it. And uh, it's it's quite fun to watch, even even if you don't understand Korean or you don't understand the 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 age of the times, just to just to watch the the fashion, just to look at the fashion that's that's uh, on display in that film is makes it worth uh, makes it worth watching. In the in the eighties. We're moving along nicely now. Park Chun Hee is assassinated. Park Chun Hee is the father, incidentally, in case you don't know, of uh, Park Bin Hye, who is fo who followed in his footsteps not by being assassinated but by becoming president. Um, we also have the Seoul Spring, although it was short-lived in 1980, and then we have Chun Doo Hwan elected as president. Now, what did he do? that was important for the film industry well he and his his colleagues came up with what they call the 3s policy 
which is sex screen and sports and what they wanted to do was distract the public kind of like bread and circuses maybe so they've they've eased censorship and so what happens when you combine the first two of the three s's when you get sex in the screen and you take away censorship you've got a bunch of erotic films ero hyongwa they were called and even the more serious films from this time displayed a high level of eroticism my wife is not happy that i'm going to show you this next slide but here it is anyways you have films like the surrogate woman on the right you can have the uh the film in the middle mechun which translates as prostitution from Yi Chin Son in 1988 and you have Madame Emma or Madame Freedom Tai Yu Buin free free wife is how you would literally translate that and this was well pretty racy especially for the times yeah Annika is quite right it was scandalous but it also uh, gave birth to the most sequels of any Korean film. I think there are more than 10 sequels there. So there's Madame Emma 1, Madame Emma 2, Madame Emma 3. And they're, they're racy films. Um, I wouldn't say they're pornographic. They're not particularly interesting, depending on what you're interested in, I guess. And that's what you've got going on in the 80s apparently sorry my wife in the late 80s we're getting closer closer to where where we are today you we get the new wave you've got the democratic uprising in june 1987 dave can tell you about that david schaefer he was already in korea at that point you have a direct presidential election You've got a society that's rapidly becoming democratized. The limitations on subject matter after 1988, they begin to be removed. You've got a permit system, so you've got more relaxation. You've got more foreign films coming in. So the import of foreign films is liberalized here. And this had a this was pretty important. The fact they they abolished the permit system for film production companies was important internally to Korea and that foreign films had an easier time getting into Korea meant that a couple of things happened. The younger filmmakers of that generation, they didn't like the fact that foreign films were coming in, not really, but they also, they rose to prominence, uh, prominence in terms of nationally because that permit system was taken away so they weren't exactly happy about the competition but they they ascended and they sort of they took over and here you've got you've got films like the life of hollywood kid in the middle the very famous chilsu and mansu and the sangyedong olympics is a new socially critical type of film it was a uh, participatory documentary film, which is very interesting, um, which looked at what was happening in a particular part of Seoul in 1988 when Seoul hosted the Olympics. Chilsu and Mansu is probably the most well-known film from this, from this point. Um, it's not really that, that great, but People really, they really like it. Um, it, it, won a, it won a prize at uh, was it the Locarno International Film Festival. And it's kind of, you know, it is political, but it's relatively light. It's not that serious. But if you put it in the context of the day when you've got these frustrations of a generation that are, are growing up under, under a pretty authoritarian rule and there's a lot of social inequality the korean remembrance of this film is is very positive and and a lot of people still remember it even though it's it's not really that great 
and I think we have time where we can watch a little bit of it. And this movie is about the struggle of these two guys, Tilsu and Mans Mansu, and they're both painters. And that's not really a, a high status job and high status jobs are are important to the to the Korean mind. And it's really, you know, it's about the common the common man. Uh, as well as being about that, it, it also it also has some commentary on cultural imperialism. You know, the love interest of, of Chilsu works at Burger King. Mansu dresses up as a painter from France to try to get attention. Chilsu wears a shirt that kind of looks like the American flag. And, you know, the billboard that you're going to see that you can see right here is an advertisement for American whiskey. So let's just let's just take a look at a little bit of this. Released on the cusp of Korea's democratic reform in 1988, Chilsu and Mansu, the debut film from director Park Kwang Su, serves as a striking example of new Korean realism. Because the political censorship laws imposed by previous authoritarian governments had been relaxed, filmmakers during this period were finally able to address and interpret the harsh realities of Korean working class experience, leading to a wave of films with working class protagonists dealing with working class themes. In Chilsu and Mansu, those protagonists are two painters on the cusp of Korean society, cut off from their families and shunned due to their low economic status. One of the main themes running throughout Chilsu and Mansu is the impossibility of communication between upper and lower classes, peeking through even during comedic moments. The political implications of this metaphor reach a boiling point in the film's final sequence. And a word of warning now, there will be spoilers ahead. The final sequence shows Chilsu and Mansu yelling out their grievances against society from the top of a towering billboard in Seoul's Gangnam district. Spectators quickly gather below to watch this spectacle, but are unable to hear their screams from down below. So they're unable to hear them, this, this idea of the impossibility of communication. You can find this on YouTube and you can, you can watch the rest of it um, because we've got, to, we've got to press on. Um, yes, as Rhea points out, the same themes as Parasite and Squid Game. This um, social inequality goes back quite a ways and the social mobility is, is it, it's reaching a, a kind of a boiling point in Korea these days. It has been for, for a while. And you can read up on a couple of different things here. We don't have time to go into them, but you can look on Wikipedia for what they call the Sampo generation. And also spoon class theory, not spoon theory, which is something different, but spoon class theory. If you look at those, this will give you an idea of what contemporary Korea is is kind of focusing on and what it has to say. So if you're tired of watching reruns of Squid Game, you can get on Wikipedia and, and read up on those two things. What happens next? We've got big business. Of course we do. We've got big business entering the film industry. The um, no, BTS doesn't have a great song about anything, Jessamine. I'm sorry. I'm. Don't come after me, Army. Don't come after me. I'm too old to to watch K-pop. I'm sorry, Kirsten. Big business. What you may have heard of as Chaebols, these conglomerates, these very large family-owned companies. They come into. I'm missing out. Well, maybe. Um, they come into the film industry around this time. You've got, in 1992, Kim Yon-sam is elected president, 
first guy without a military background, that could be important. You've got the post-Cold War atmosphere move towards a consumer society. The Korean new wave that we just talked about for a couple of minutes, that kind of faded away. You've got Samsung and SK and Daewoo, and they're really pushing the industrialization of films now. And what they did is they went and they did surveys and they found out, you know, what did people want to watch? And you end up with lots and lots of romantic comedies because that's what people wanted to, uh, wanted to, wanted to see. So you've got lots of those mid and late nineties, you've got just explosive growth and you've got the first weekly cinema magazine, uh, Cine 21 is, is first published. It's a weekly magazine in, uh, in Korean. So we're really, we're getting, we're getting big now. And what these conglomerates did is they got together with younger filmmakers. So you've got romantic comedies like Kyoran Iyagi, Marriage Story, and Beat, and The Ginkgo Bed, Uneng Namu. Um, Uneng is actually the word for bank in Korean. So when I first moved here, I got I was really, really impressed with myself because I knew what a bank tree was. And that's not what it means. It's not a bank tree. It's just a ginkgo tree. You learn some Korean and then you realize that you're you're wrong and you have to go back. Such such it goes. So it goes. The neoliberal era in the late 1990s. What do we have going on? Well, it wasn't a great time. November of 97, South Korea has to ask the IMF for money. IMF in turn demands restructuring of Korean industries. And what happens? We've got unemployment price hikes. Yeah, spell check fails again. Price hikes and a sharp decline of exchange rates. So yeah, everything falls. The older conglomerates move out of the business, but other major corporations come in. So you've got CJ Entertainment, which is CJ Entertainment, which is still around. And you've got Lotte and Orion, and you can still see these companies producing films to this day. You've got the government supporting the film industry. You've got more subjects, so things are really opening up. And another thing that was quite important was the arrival of multiplex cinemas. So you've got the number of screens going way up and you've got the number of viewers that went way, way up. Uh, Wayne has just pointed out, yeah, that um, there's a new Netflix documentary called The Raincoat Killer, which, uh, which goes, uh, does it go over the IMF crisis? I haven't watched it yet. I can't spend all my time watching Netflix. I wish, I wish I could. Um, so yeah, late 1990s, you've got a couple of things that are worth watching. Um, and both of these are good fun. You've got the, the thing on the left, which is attack the gas station. This portrays youth culture post IMF. And there's an interesting article that I can share with you all, if you want, that goes into the phrase just because, or in Korean, it's kunyang, means like no reason or just because, uh, which is quite important in, in that particular film. And you've got an absolute banger of a classic, uh, a whole series called Yogo Gwedam, which is like, um, it, it's a, a series set in, girls high schools, the English translation is whispering corridors, um, teen high school horror films, favorites, they're really good. And that's actually quite important in terms of the Korean horror film because it, it changed the, the sight of Korean horror from the family home, which is where it had resided for a long time into the school. And there's social critique to be had in both of these films, but it's a little bit more buried. Um, let's just take a look at a little bit of the trailer for Attack the Gas Station. You'll notice right away CJ, CJ Entertainment. You'll still see this. There could be a curse word or two. 
So be warned. A hilarious attack begins. Yes, Jessamine, hilarious. It's that's actually quite interesting because as it starts out, it's kind of, you know, they're bored, they're punks, they're robbing a gas station again. Why are they robbing a gas station? Kunyang, just because they're bored. And it starts out and it's sort of funny, but there is uh there's an interesting article on this that I can share with you that talks about why it is that something that is quite violent and there are violent parts in this movie that aren't hilarious like they they lock a woman in the trunk of a car and they basically leave her there that's not really there's nothing funny about that and yet the overall impression that Korean audiences were left with and the basic view that they have of this film is that it's it's funny it's hilarious it's it's quite interesting because some of the things that they do it, it's it's not hilarious um one example that comes to mind is that one of the young thugs he makes the boss of the gas station repair the phone which he then smashes and this cycles through and it it, it repeats over and over again where the one person fixes the phone and then the guy comes in and he he busts it up again so yeah you're right to to question that i'll send you that article later on so now we're at the point where we've got what the film industry here calls the korean the korean blockbuster which they they take as kind of a a backhanded compliment because korea can now produce blockbusters, but they can't just call them blockbusters. They have to call them Korean blockbusters. And you also have global co-productions now. So we've got films 
in terms of their quantity and quality are up. You've got major directors now making their debuts, and these are the directors that we've, we now, the names that you will probably know. In terms of the foreign market, the exports are crime, horror, and action. That's what people are watching internationally. And the international film festivals, as I think I've already mentioned, they really served as the stepping stone to promoting this export mainly there were other things that were going on as well but the film festivals were particularly important so what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to take a sip of water delicious and refreshing and we're going to switch gears a little bit because once we get to the the turn of the century the 2000s we've got so much that's going on and you all are probably if i were to continue as i've gone along so far i'd probably be telling you things you already know and i don't really need to do that do i no so what i'm gonna do now is i'm gonna go genre by genre and i'm gonna give you some recommendations so that if you like a particular genre you can have a film title that you can go look at these ones aren't free yeah james sorry i can't talk about film festivals i don't have time um yeah recommendations by genre and i'm also going to talk a little bit about people that you can look for because people are part of this as well if if you're a fan of war films there are a few as you can imagine given the importance of the korean war to korea there are a lot of films that deal with this topic in different ways and these three are among the most famous and they're all very very different um Teguki, which is also the name for the korean flag in, in case you don't know Teguki, the brotherhood of war is quite interesting it's a a relatively complicated plot line for a war film, but it shows you pretty much what you would think about when you think about a war film. Lots of people, lots of fighting, lots of dying, and that sort of thing. The film in the middle is one of the most famous films for Koreans. Uh, it's called Gukche uh, Sidang. In English, it's called Ode to My Father. If you want to watch this one, it's very oriented towards one particular family. Bring your tissues with you. And I'll tell you, even the younger generation of Koreans know about this film and they have seen it. So it's a it's a perennial favorite and it's it's quite it's quite sad. If you prefer your films a little bit quirkier, you can watch the kind of comedy quaint welcome to Dongmako, which is about this quasi fictitious village where you have a, a downed American pilot and then he ends up meeting these people who are completely insulated from what's going on outside they don't know about the war they don't know about North Korea and South Korea. And of course, you end up with North Koreans and South Koreans coming together and having to coexist. And the message in the end is, is well, I don't want to give you any spoilers, but it's it's not particularly sad. It's quite quaint. Any of these three movies, if if you wanted to, if you're interested in war, the Korean War, you can you can watch these to get a sense of what's important or what is on on some Koreans minds when they when they think about that. Uh, related genre is the spy film or the spy action film and you've got three of these here that are that are quite good you've got the age of shadows. Um, yeah well yeah I sorry I didn't cry when I watched it Rhea, but I don't know. I hardly ever do that when I watch movies. The Age of Shadows, Kim Ji-un, 
another excellent film by that director. He's one of my favorites. You have Assassination set in the early 20th century. Uh, another great film. These are more interesting for just the, the quality of films that you get. And Shiri or Swiri in the middle, it should be Shiri from 1999 is interesting. It, it really emulates more of the action and the, what is it, the high octane energy of, uh, of John Woo films and action films like that. But it's well, well worth watching. All of these are, are very entertaining films and you can see the quality of filmmaking that's going on in Korea. Now I have to talk about this, and again, I might have to whisper in case my wife hears me talking about it. We have to talk about revenge because Korea has a real fascination with this concept. There are a lot of films that deal explicitly with revenge, and these films, they are savage at times. So you'd better be ready for some ultra violence if, if you're gonna watch these but they are well worth watching most of them and the the best of them the most well known of them is park chanuk's vengeance trilogy you have three films in this in the middle you have old boy as i mentioned possibly the most famous korean film internationally at least on the right you have chinjoran gumjashi or its english translation sympathy for lady vengeance which is super duper awesome and you have sympathy for Mr. Vengeance on the left. This idea of revenge, which has close cultural connotations to a Korean concept called Han, is just, um, yep, yeah, and Rhea points out My Name, which is one of the new Netflix series, is another revenge drama. Um, Koreans, they just love their revenge. They're great. But with with any of these films, I want to just take a, a little moment and tell you why I love watching Korean films or films from from cultures other than my own, although I'm Canadian and I'm told we don't have a culture, so I don't, I'm not too sure about that. You you learn things and I love this about film and you won't learn this from a BTS song or maybe you will if they have good songs about spoon class theory like when I watched. Chinjaran Gumjashi, I learned about tofu. Let me share. No, Jochana, yo, Kyoro. Koseng mana, chu, chip samyan pan, chung mal, tegan omnida. I stopped it because she she says something naughty to him you can see here he's so proud of her and he gives her this tofu and he he explains to her why this is important because this is about re rebirth and now of course the the symbolism of the color white which is attached to purity and and here we have you know the idea of now she's done her time in prison and she's free and she very delicately reaches out with one finger and tips it over absolutely amazing it's an amazing film and the dress she is wearing by the way uh became apparently a big hit and women were were wearing were wearing the the lady vengeance dress apparently uh, this might be apocryphal but it sounds like it's true kind of in a similar way to how people in the 19th century wore yellow raincoats or yellow coats after the sorrows of young werther i think it was a yellow coat anyways you learn these little details about culture and it's absolutely fascinating 
And you, you also might wonder, you know, why are these people dressed in Santa outfits and what are they doing standing outside a prison? And who's this guy and why is he here? And what does it mean when she just delicately reaches out and tips that over? What's she saying? It's just, it's great. And it's these little details that you get that, that really, they take you down the same roads as people are right now exploring with Squid Game a lot of the time. But this is why I love films and Korean films are really awesome. Uh, the other one of the other films in this trio is uh, the film Old Boy, and you can pick up some some culture in here as well, even if it's just figuring out what Korean names mean, or maybe it's learning how Korean police treat drunken businessmen. Um, you know, the the friend shows up and takes him out, and he basically gets treated well very differently than he would in other countries because you know there are reasons for that oh my favorite which i could talk about for hours but i won't horror this film that's in the middle of tale of two sisters by kim Jun is an absolute corker of a horror film it's super duper awesome um the more i read about it the more i watch it the more I learn about it, it's just it's just super impressive. Uh, and if you like a mind bending kind of spooky story, this is the one for you. I fully recommend it. It's awesome. Um, you can also watch the Whispering Corridors series, any of those. Get your popcorn, get a beer or a cider and be prepared to be entertained as as people die and get revenge. And if you want to go a different way, you can watch the Korean version or the Korean reimagining of Hansel and Gretel, a really, really well told story. And I would recommend this because you've got a story that we in the West, if I can generalize like that, we know what the story is, but it's populated with characters that are quite specifically Korean in some ways, and you have to figure out why those are. It's really, really well made, and it is super duper interesting. Tale of Two Sisters is the, the bang on winner. Now, Rhea in the chat says, uh, Gok Song is the scariest. It is really good. The English title of that is The Wailing, uh, and here you get, um, some some really nice reaching back into Korean history and Korean shamanism. You get a little a little nudge uh, at Japan because the the evil the evil villain is is a guy who's come over from Japan and that that could be important. Um, you have some really great moments in it that are super duper uncomfortable. It's really great, um, but it's not for. You know, you've got to have a, you've got to have a strong heart to deal with that. These horror films that I've got here, you know, you can, you can come away and you won't be, you won't be too traumatized by them, but the wailing might, uh, it might just set your teeth a little too far on edge, but sure, Rhea, it's, it's a, it's a good one. My wife hates that one even more than she hates uh, some of the other films that I've chosen here. Um, period dramas are awesome. As I've mentioned, Koreans love these things and they're great just as spectacle, just as visual displays, the, the costumes, the military costumes in the Admiral, the court costumes in Hwang Jin Yi, and, um, and the court costumes in, in Masquerade, the uh, Gwang Hae, are just, they're amazing to look at. If you, if you like hats, if you're a fan of hats, the the nobility the noble class in korean history they have the most amazing horsehair hats they come in different shapes and sizes they're absolutely fabulous i love them they're great um you can watch the admiral which is about a very famous korean Yi Sun shin a korean general 
masquerade is not historically accurate. Huang Jini is about one of the most famous uh, Korean women historically. Uh, and uh, Huang Jini, incidentally, if you like poetry, she's a very famous poet. And you can, you can go and find a, uh, a lesson written by me, actually, uh, and I can give you a link for that if you'd like it, on teaching the particular type of poetic form that she, um, that she wrote in called Shijo. Uh, she is the Korean word for poem. Shijo is a, it's a th short three line poem. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Isn't it just haiku? Well, haiku is Japanese and Shijo is Korean and we gotta keep those two things separate. Um, the one, caution that I would give you here, which probably doesn't tell you anything you don't already know, is that these are heavily romanticized tellings. They're historically not on the spot all the time. And for some, you know, for some, in some ways that's understandable because they're meant to be entertainment and in other ways they could be pushing a particular agenda. But if they give you the impetus to go to Wikipedia and look up the characters that are in them or look up the battles that were fought when the Japanese invaded Korea again, or to, to get interested or learn more about Korean, then they are, they are worth your time. Uh, the Admiral is one of the highest grossing films, if not the highest grossing film in, in Korean film history. Huang Dini has had two film treatments and a couple of, um, small screen series as well. Uh, one of the hot topics that's going on, and this again comes back to Squid Game because doesn't everything come back to Squid Game these days? If you are interested in Korean feminism or just feminism in general, there are a couple of films that are quite important. Uh, Kim Ji Young, born 1982, was adapted from a novel uh, you can also buy the English translation of that. If you're a Kindle fan, you can buy it on Kindle. You can buy a hard copy, whichever. And an earlier film, 301, 302, a bit more, is it a bit more arty than, no, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. My wife didn't like it, but she's not a film critic, so whatever. And I've put a one of the up and coming female directors here, Kim Bora, you are gonna see a lot more films by Korean female directors coming in the future. You'll notice that up until now, you know, the, the directors that I've been mentioning have been men. And that's not, it's not my fault. That's just kind of the way it is. That's going to change. And uh, women are really, from what I understand, they're really going to be at the helm of the next generation of, of filmmakers. If you like the social or the political or youth films, I've mentioned these, a couple of these already, March of the Fools and Attack the Gas Station. The film A Taxi Driver, not Taxi Driver, which is completely different. And it's, uh, that was Scorsese, wasn't it? Um, with Robert De Niro, not the same film, uh, is well worth watching. And you can see down here, it won a bunch of awards. It's an entertaining journey, but it can be your entry point into a very significant political event in Korean history. So if that's your thing, you can try that movie out Attack the Gas Station is ridiculous fun. March of the Fools is fun, as I mentioned, just for the sheer fashion of it all. If you're into the gangster movies, Korea's got those as well. Um, the one in the middle called Breathless is savage. Unless you really like your violence, you, you could maybe stay away from that one. Um, Won Bin is the gentleman on the left played in a movie called Ajoshi, which got the very interesting English translation of the man from nowhere, which kind of makes me think that it's like a film noir, which it really isn't. Um, Ajoshi just means uncle or mister. Well, yeah, just 
Mr. in English. Um, it's a great, and again, it has elements of revenge, but it's super popular. And I would recommend this film if you want to learn how to curse in Korean, because the translations of the curse words are excellent. Nope, my wife didn't hear me say that. And uh, the action is really good and has quite a sweet and uh, quite a sweet ending to it. Another very interesting, uh, interesting film is what they call in English. They, in English, they call it coin locker girl. In Korean, it's just the transliteration of the word Chinatown. I guess they didn't want to call it Chinatown in English possibly because there's an English film called Chinatown and partially because they didn't want to offend people unnecessarily. It has the wonderful Kim Go-Woon in it. She's super duper. And um, yes, as it turns out, as you see, if you watch My Name on Netflix, uh, Korean women, they, they, can, they can beat people up just, just as well as, um, as Korean men came. Uh, has a Gone Girl vibe, yeah, uh, these, well, maybe poster wise, but yeah, Gone Girl, my wife and I actually just watched that on Netflix and she really liked it. Yeah, Coin Locker Girl is nothing like Gone Girl, but they're both really good. So Coin Locker Girl, quite, quite interesting. Um, they call her Coin Locker Girl because that's where she was dropped off when she was a baby is in one of these coin lockers. And she was found and then taken in by uh, by a, a mama san who who taught her how to how to get along in the world. It's uh, it's quite good. It's quite interesting. Any one of these, if you're into gangster films, that could that could be your thing. They're they're quite interesting. <sighs> if you like romantic comedies, Korea has a whole bunch of those don't we know and you've got you can see just the color schemes in here and you can tell from my voice that this is not it's not my jam i don't watch romantic comedies but i realize that other people do and you like them if you do there these three are from what i hear quite popular um yeah Reyes is my sassy girl my sassy girl is one of the most famous korean movies of all time the 200 pound beauty is is quite is quite interesting. Um, it has one of the most famous uh, Korean songs, I think, is from there. Um, my love, my bride is also very, very popular. This isn't my thing. I, I freely admit that. But, uh, you know, Koreans love their romantic comedies. So, yeah, if that's your thing, you can you can do that. You can watch those. Now, if you really want to dive headfirst into Korean culture, if you really want to see something that encapsulates Korean, Korea in one film, this is it. This is called the most Korean film ever. And I looked for the source on that and I couldn't find it, but I'm sure I didn't just make it up. Um, you can find this on YouTube. You can search uh, for, for this. The title is Sopyeonje. I spelled it out for you there and put ENG at the end. And you can, you can see it with English subtitles. It is just an amazing film, but you're not going to understand it when you when you watch it you're going to need to do some homework you're going to need to do some some reading about it but there's a there's lots that's out there about it you can go to wikipedia and and find out and find it and and you can see the critical responses um in the year it was released the korean film critics award it won best film best director best actor best new actress best cinematography Best and Best Music at the Grand Bell Awards in the same year it won Best New Actor, Best New Actress, Best Film, Best Director, Best Cinematography, and Best Sound Recording. So it's a winner, but it, it will take you some reading in order to even attempt to appreciate what, what it means. I don't have time 
to get into it, but I want to show you a little bit, not from this particular movie, but from a, um, a TV show that featured one of the songs from this movie. Now, you're going to see we're on we're on TV now. And these people are going to she's going to sing the song, the lady who's who's crouched down there. And the guy who's standing up is going to yell at her a little bit. He's not really yelling at her. He's just he's trying to encourage her in a certain way. And what I'd like you to do, in addition to watching them and listening to them, is look at how the audience reacts to just hearing this this music. And it's a little bit complicated because some of the people you'll see that stand up and are very expressive are invited guests to the show and they're, you know, it's it's for TV so they're being a little bit dramatic, but the real audience, the people who are sitting sitting down their reactions tell you something and yeah just kill me now please. <sighs> And I'm, I might cry. It's too much. So I put some things in the chat there that you can links that you can find, um, not just for for Sopion Day, but for some of the other um, the other movies that I talked about. But I'll pop this 
this YouTube line, which uh, this YouTube link, which is part of the actual movie. And you can watch that on your own and get your tissues out because yeah, it's an intense fault. It's an intense song. Yeah, it's an intense movie. It has to do with the concept of Han, which is Korean. And I'm just gonna, <laughs> there is n no, Wayne, there's not, it's not, no, it's not a happy ending. That's not really a spoil. Oh yeah, it kind of is a spoiler, maybe. Hmm. Well, you could construe it as happy. Bittersweet, I think, is the best I can do. Um, if you watch that movie, there's a lot written on it. Uh, there's a 12 page essay that I, I just ran over about this concept of Han and how it's expressed in this particular movie. It's very, very complicated, more complicated than we have a chance to get into. But if you really want to dive into the deep end of the cultural pool, you you can watch that movie and in that youtube link even if you just click on it and you go down and you look at the comments the comments on youtube are usually just it's horrible right it's a bunch of crazy people a lot of the time for this it it really isn't um it's such such an important film and it's such a, a great film that i just i'm i'm gonna stop talking about it now because it's awesome so you should go watch it now before i finish i want to tell you about some people that you can look for and actors that you might see who are awesome che min shik is my personal favorite you see him all over the place probably if you don't watch a lot of korean films you saw him in the movie lucy where he played oh yeah a gangster which was awesome lee byung hyun in the middle You've probably seen him. He was in The Magnificent Seven, which was awesome. He's in a couple of other things, quite good. And Song Kang-ho, one of Bong Joon-ho's favorite actors. You'll see him now and again. Those are people you can look for that you'll see if actors are your way into Korean film and you're looking for particular people, their quality. For actresses, Han So He is the new the new star. Uh, there's currently apparently a push to get her to play the role of Silk, one of the Marvel characters. Um, I hope so. She's awesome. She's done really well. On the other side, we have Kim Yoon Jin, and you can see her in on the small screen and the big screen in the West. In the West, is that really a thing anymore? The West. Kim Yoon Jin. She was in Lost. A few years ago, uh, she was in, I think she was in another series called Mistresses, but I'm not sure. She's done movies in English. She's done movies in Korean. She was in the movie Shiri in 1999. And I must admit, I have a little bit of a crush on her. And yes, my wife probably heard that. And in the middle, we have Yoon Yo Jong, who's just, I mean, she's just a national treasure, this lady. She's kind of like the Dame Judy Dench of, of Korea, I guess. I'm not quite sure how well that allegory works, but she's awesome. You'll see her in movies. She's always a star. She won uh, an award for uh, her role in Minari recently, which didn't I didn't even mention until now, which is a mix of, of Korean and English, which you can watch. And she's fabulous. Um, you can find her on YouTube. Uh, I'm not going to play this for you, but people really like her sense of humor. They think she's quite funny. She's also, she seems like just a nice lady. One of her TV shows has her going around and, and opening up restaurants in different countries, but they're always Korean food restaurants. So she's kind of doing the, the Korean cultural export thing, uh, lighter stuff, but, but very entertaining. And, and she's just absolutely fabulous Before. now of course when it comes to korean films really the way the the way most people are getting to know them is through these different directors uh bong joon ho doesn't need any introduction i want to meet him i want to raise a glass with him because he just looks like he's a fun guy and uh he he 
was inquiring when he was backstage at the Oscars if if the drink tray that, that was just for show was actually real and they had to tell him no uh and he's also uh a, a real auteur he goes he goes back and uh he he really really knows his craft really well uh park tanuk in the middle looks completely just like a normal person uh but he's the director behind the vengeance trilogy uh he's done the the handmaiden which is a, a, another amazing korean film Im Guan Tech, whose work we've seen, he was he's been around for for a long, long time. His films are very, very well regarded, as we saw. You can look for his works; they're everywhere. Um, Im Sang Su, one of the other Korean directors, you can look for his name. Uh, Kim Ki Duk is a little bit of a controversial figure because he is not apparently a very nice person. And he's been in trouble for his treatment of various people. But his films, you know, I leave it up to you. If you separate the art from the man, then you can go and watch his films. If if you don't want to do that, then you should maybe a- avoid him. Yeah, he's he's up there. I mean, I don't know if I'd put him in the same class as uh, a Harvey Weinstein or anything, but um, yeah he he's he's not been he's been you know i don't want to be flippant about it he's not been a nice guy um but on the other hand he he's dead so we don't really have to worry about him anymore that's a horrible thing to say but he actually died from covid related complications a little while ago in this place in latvia uh in the middle my personal favorite kim Jiun he directed a tale of two sisters which is awesome his career is really quite varied he did an, what what is called an eastern western the good the bad and the weird which of course is a play on the good the bad and the ugly he authored he authored uh, a tale of two sisters which was great he also has another revenge film called angmabrul boata uh, i saw the devil which is savage which has chemin shik and Yi byung hyun in it um absolutely great director really 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 a big a big fan of his hello michael free here sorry you can't see me i'm recording this from my office yes it all went wrong at this point oh no so close to the end but don't worry what i'm going to do is I'm going to give you the end of my presentation. It's just going to be in a little bit of a different format. We're going to be able to watch a smidgen of three different people that I've just been speaking about, Yoon Yo Jong, Bong Joon Ho, and Sharon Che. We're going to just watch little snippets of how awesome these different people are. And then at the end, I'm going to give you a bit more information and then we'll wrap up. A little bit different than what we plan to do, but it all works out in the end. Mr. Brad Pitt, finally. <laughs> nice to meet you. Where were you while we were filming in Tulsa? It's very honored to meet you. Uh, as you know, I'm from Korea and Actually, my name is Yeo Jung Yoon, and it, most of European people call me Yeo Young, and some of them call me Yoo Jung. But tonight, you are all forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot believe <laughs> I'm here. Well, that's, okay, let me pull myself together. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for the tremendous thanks to the Academy members that who vote for me. And, and next speech, okay, they usually say, okay, thank you for the <laughs> uh, wonderful Minari family. Um, Stephen, Isaac, Yeri, and Noel Allen. We became a family. And most of all, above all, 
Lee Isaac Chung. Without him, I couldn't be here tonight. He was our captain and my director. So thanks to you. Tremendous thanks to you. And I'd like to thank to, well, see, I don't believe in competition. I, how can I win Glenn Close? Win over Glenn Close. <laughs> I've been watching her so many performances. So this is just uh, all the nominees, five nominees. Uh, we are the winner for the different movie, different role. We play the different role. So we cannot compete each other. Tonight I'm here is just, I have just a little bit luck, I think. Maybe I'm luckier than you. <laughs> And also maybe is a American hospitality for the Korean actor. I'm not sure, but anyway, thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to thank to my two boys uh, who made me go out and work. Uh, so <laughs> beloved son, all and new. It, this is the result uh, because mommy worked so hard. <laughs> And I'd like to dedicate this award for my first director, Kim gi who was a very genius director. That I made a movie together with him, first movie. I think he would be very happy if he's still alive. Thank you very much. A tremendous thank you for the everybody. I came from a place very far away. I live in South Korea. <laughs> so in campus, we held several illegal film festivals yeah. where we would have unofficial screenings at local cinematheques. Yeah. 네, 이제 저희가 그 미국 인디펜던트 영화들을 많이 영화제에서 틀고 저희가 직접 서브 타이틀도 자막도 넣고 막 그랬단 말이죠. 네. At the time, we would screen a lot of American indie films and create subtitles ourselves. The, the movie I did the subtitle was the, the <laughs> Jungle Fever and Do the Right Thing. And so... <laughs> and so... <clears throat> 영어, 영어를 이제 잘, 뭐, 그때도 잘, 뭐, 영어 실력이 부족한 상태에서 그거를 서브타이틀 열심히 했는데, 와, 이렇게 그렇게 다양한 욕들이 있는지 처음 알았어요. 그, Spike Lee 덕분에 그걸 많이 배웠어요. 그래가지고. So at the time, my English wasn't that good. So subtitling it was quite an experience. I had no idea there was such various curse words in the English language. Thanks to Spike Lee, I learned so many things. 아 너무 막 예, 흥분이 되고 영광스러워서 이제 급하게 사진을 찍었죠. 이제 같이 사진 찍고 그랬는데 아 내가 그 누더라이트싱 자막을 했었다 그 얘기는 못했어요. 아, 지금 다시 만나면 그 얘기를 하고 싶다. 누구 스파이클이 아는 분 있으면 그 얘기 좀 전해 주세요. 예. So I was so excited and honored. I made sure to take a picture right away, but things were so hectic I didn't get the chance to tell him I subtitled do the right thing. If I meet him again, I would love to tell him if any of you guys are acquainted with him, please let him know. Thank you. Thank you everyone. You will be almost sick of me after this film. So I wanted that sequence to feel like a road movie in the rain. As the characters move from the rich house to the poor house, they descend vertically uh, further below. I want the actors to feel as comfortable as possible. I want them to feel like they're fish fresh out of water, free to flap around whenever they want. So it wasn't as if I had this petty scheme to make Parasite seem like a sequel to The Host. <laughs> She's really amazing. I don't know how she can do this. And yeah, perfect translator in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this person that Oscar's winning director Bong Joon-ho praised? It's his translator Sharon Choi who spent this long award season with Parasite team. After director Bong's film, Parasite won four awards at Oscars and changed its 92 years of history. Not only the media, but the whole world is paying attention to what Bong says. 
With a tremendous ability to deliver Bung's exact messages into his adequate words and tone, Choi has also been gaining attention from all across the world. On YouTube, videos of Choi translating on stage became popular by surpassing 1 million views. Even America's major media like New York Times wrote separate articles exclusively focusing on Sharon Choi. During an interview with E! News on red carpet, Bong even said that Sharon herself has a huge fandom. I know she has a huge fandom. She's, I know you do, Sharon! <laughs> There is not much known about Choi. The 25-year-old is also a filmmaker who has previously made a short film and is reportedly working on a new film now. On the backstage of Oscars, Bong even confirmed that Choi is a filmmaker who studied film in the university. He added, actually she's writing some feature-length script, I'm so curious about it. Choi's English is widely praised and recognized for narrowing the culture difference between South Korea and Western countries by bringing out the subtle nuance. She was even dubbed as the MVP of Oscars. Choi is reportedly looking to make a feature film which may have been inspired by her award season experiences. On Twitter, fans of Parasite, Bong Juno, and Sharon Choi are supporting her new goal. Now that the award season has ended, fans might be able to meet Choi not as a translator but as a film director herself. So that's just about it. Just a couple more things. Places to look for Korean film, you can go to the Korean Film Archive. Just Google it. You can go on there. You can see a number of really great Korean films, classic films for free on demand. You can go to their YouTube channel. Just search Korean classic film and it will pop up right away. Subscribe to that. You can get the same content there. And, uh, you know, as Ricky Gervais said, Netflix, you win everything. Netflix has more stuff coming out that's Korean, more Korean content. So if you haven't had your fill after Squid Game and all the other good stuff that they've got on there, more stuff is coming. Now, we need to talk about books because I know you're, well, maybe not all of you, but a lot of you are book people. Here are some books for you to look at and read. Now we would have the discussion, but we're not going to have the discussion because nobody's here and I'm alone in my office. Thank you very much. Goodbye. But you can still talk to me on Discord. So maybe meet me there. I'll see you or speak to you or be in touch with you in some way, shape or form. Good night. Chal chal